I am in good mood. I went for a run. I came home. I made the most delicious homemade smoothie. Ooh. Hi, I'm Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. So much late night jokes to catch up on. I'm sure you saw that the CDC got rid of the mask mandate on planes. Kimmel, Governor Ron DeSantis, praised the decision. He tweeted it was great to see a federal judge in Florida follow the law and reject the Biden transportation mask mandate, or as he calls it, critical face theory. Fallon, but don't worry to keep everybody safe. Now you can only bring 3.4 ounces of COVID on board. To put it another way, airlines are basically turning off the seatbelt sign for COVID and telling you to move freely about the cabin. Yeah, if you thought Omicron was bad, wait till you meet the spirit variants. Jimmy Kimmel, all the major airlines have already updated their policy on face coverings. Delta, American, United, Southwest, JetBlue, Frontier and Spirit announced they were no longer require passengers to wear a mask. Spirit Airlines actually never had an official mask requirement because they don't have windows on the plane. Trevor. Just as a general rule, nothing should change mid-flight ever. That would be like if a roller coaster decided to rethink its safety policies while you're ready on the ride, Colbert. It's like being told halfway through a dinner party that it's an orgy. I wasn't prepared for an orgy. I'm all filled up on dinner rolls and I'm wearing the wrong underwear. Fallon, yeah, passengers were dancing, hugging, kissing, and now they're all in quarantine. <laughs> Meanwhile, in New Jersey, yesterday was 421, and it was the first day you could buy marijuana in New Jersey. They skipped the whole 420 thing. Jimmy Fallon said, really? That's like Chipotle offering free guac on Cesc de Mayo. You know what I'm saying, Colbert? It's exciting news, but it means New Yorkers will have to do the unthinkable. Drive to New Jersey on purpose. Jimmy Kimmel was on Kara Swisher's podcast. He said, I don't think we should cancel Tucker Carlson. I think that Tucker Carlson is on commercial television. And if you don't like Tucker Carlson, you should not buy the products that are advertised on the show. And if you feel like writing a letter to those companies, you should write a letter to them. But I don't think it's a good idea to shut people up because I want to know where people are coming from. I want to know what they think. I want to know if they have horrible thoughts. I want to hear their confessions. Now, do I believe Tucker Carlson believes the things he says? I do not. I think he's a phony in every respect. I think he's an algorithm. I think his audience created him. I think he started out as a fairly down the middle political broadcaster in a cute little bow tie with polka dots on it. Kimmel was then asked about Joe Rogan, who, by the way, sometimes I forget this. Joe Rogan replaced Jimmy Kimmel as the host of The Man Show. About Joe Rogan, Kimmel said, I don't think that anybody should be shut up. I wish people would pay attention to the facts and I wish people were just consistent. I don't know Joe Rogan at all. I've met him and I think he's a funny guy. And I think that probably most of what he says is entertaining and fun to listen to. I know people who trust what he says. And I personally know people who have put themselves in danger because he minimized the importance of vaccines. But I also know that it's not as black and white as sometimes the media makes it out to be. This next story is random. I was prepping the show, looking ahead, dropping down some notes about the upcoming uh, Netflix comedy festival, which doesn't start for another week. But I saw this one on May 6th and I'm jazzed. I mean, I'm not going to it. I'd like to go to it. May 6th. That's my time with David Letterman. Letterman's going to do stand up. Yeah. The show also includes Rosebud Baker, Phil Wong and Sam Merrill on the first night. Second night, Brian Simpson, Robin Tran and Naomi X. Perigen on the second. No offense, second night. That first night's a pretty killer lineup. Plus David Letterman doing stand up. Guess he's going to act as the MC. That's pretty cool. I'd love to see Dave do like a set set. I mean, we got 30 years of him doing two jokes, five jokes. Would love to see a whole set from David Letterman. Dean Cook. He's back in Boston, baby. He's doing one night at the Botch Center Wang Theater in Boston Saturday night. From Vanya Land, Dane said when he's back in Boston, it all comes back to me. Every turn of the corner, whether it's a place that's still there or unfortunately long gone, I'll find myself pointing out the window and saying, I used to write jokes right there. Or I used to meet with my improv in that school playground. For these shows, Dane knows he could just do something comfortable and familiar and get by, but at the end of the day, what fun is that, writes Vanya Land. Dane said, I don't want to just do something I know I'm able to do. I'd like to try and do something when I'm coming home to Boston more than any other time that makes people look at the whole journey and think, man, from the first time I saw him to today, he's going to come in and do something that makes the room feel like when we all leave, we'll never experience again. That's the relevancy you need for yourself to continue to want to do this and tell people to come check it out. Because I know that there's more that I need to meet inside of myself. And when I do that and I get tangled in the funny, it makes for a great night. He made a comparison to Carlin. Calm down. Dane Cook was not comparing himself to George Carlin. Relax. You don't have to write Dane Cook a letter. His point was George Carlin started out as the hippy dippy weatherman. And his comedy evolved over the years. 
to the, uh, at the time, at the turn of the century, what people like me were calling the angry George Carlin, that now 20 years later is the holy cow, what a prophet that guy was, George Carlin. Dane wants to continue to evolve. He said that really encapsulates some of the new stuff where it's always been observe and report. But now more than ever, it's more personal because I'm diving into experiences that are hardships, capsizing and traumatic moments. But I'm doing it in very funny ways. I've got this 30 year moment in my career where I can do things better than I did them before because I have new tools and I've learned new words and I've traveled so I can talk from experience having ventured. But it's also a part of the journal that tells you this is where I am now. I'm very proud to bring something like this forward and put my time and energy into something, and I'm damn excited to share beyond these stages in Boston where I can give people a night of laughs, where they are. I've been through hell and high water, both personally and professionally, suffering from foot and mouth disease and making my own mistakes. At the same time, always wanted to don that Red Sox hat because, sorry to sound like an effing schmuck, but all I've ever wanted to do was make the city of Boston proud of me. Billy Crystal weighed in on the slap. Yeah, that was like three weeks ago, Billy. However... Billy's got a musical opening next week, so Yahoo spoke to him, and he got in on the topical thing. Billy Crystal, by the way, hosted the Oscars nine times, so he might know what he's talking about. Billy said Chris Rock's joke wasn't a great one, and added, Why go after her? I thought it was misplaced. I love Chris Rock, and we're friends, and I so respect him. I just thought it was wrong. Billy shared his initial reaction to the slap, calling Will Smith's move a, quote, crime. Crystal said, "Uh uh-oh, uh-oh, and then fortunately it was a horrible thing, and it's a crime. The fortunate thing is it wasn't a closed fist. Because then you might have had a Kermit Washington situation. Now you're like, what? Who's Kermit Washington? What are you talking about? Billy Crystal breaking out a reference from a 1977 Lakers-Rockets basketball game. Apparently Kermit Washington threw a punch. I'm old. Even I'm not that old. I was, what, I've been eight? I don't remember it, Billy. Update your references. Billy said, I thought Chris Rock handled himself as well as he could and kept it together. It was a shocking moment. I was concerned very much for the mental state of Will Smith. I was very worried and concerned and shocked by the aftermath of that, too. It was an assault. I've had experiences. I hosted the Grammys three times, and I've been thrown things. Cleveland.com spoke to Mark Marin. Mark plays a sneak in the film that's out now called The Bad Guys. Marin said, yeah, I think this movie has a great look to it, a great sort of pace to it. There's a concept here that's fairly grown up. I think the ability for it to be watchable by adults in a way that it isn't too cute is good. Also, the thrust of the movie is, can these bad guys be good? It's not like it rides a line, but it's also a fun movie for grown-ups. So yeah, it's a good movie for me to be in. If you really think about it, me and Sam Rockwell and Craig Robinson, it's a pretty edgy crew. Okay, Mark, but what about the snake? I wouldn't call this snake sneaky. I think this snake defies snake stereotypes. What are the snake stereotypes? Let's think about that. Um, they slither, they, they bite you, they have venom... They're slithery. Are there snake stereotypes? I digress. This snake defies snake stereotypes. He's not particularly cunning or duplicitous. Are snakes duplicitous? Don't they just like slither around? And I I digress again. He's very upfront. He's very emotional. He's sensitive. He's probably the crankiest one of the bunch, the most emotional one of the bunch, and the most terrified of the friendship bond diminishing or the group breaking up. So he actually goes against the snake stereotypes. Don't digress again. From Vulture, Patton Oswalt. He plays Chuck Coulson, who is nicknamed Nixon's Bulldog. This is a new thing on Stars dropping on Sunday. It's called Gaslit. Patton Oswalt told Vulture, it's funny that he was Nixon's bulldog, Nixon's hatchet man, because he was so not suited for the job. I think he's like a lap gorgy. It's walked twice a day, and they just give him little cold turkey slices because his stomach is very sensitive. And not just any corgi, one of Queen Elizabeth II's corgis. May they rest in peace. He's a palace corgi. He's never existed below or above 72 degrees. He has never felt air that's above or below that temperature. That's all he knows. There's a new episode of my very casual travel podcast. It is called Travel is Back. And on this episode, I left Hoover Dam and I started driving over to Lake Mead and I got sidetracked. And that's what's on this week's episode of Travel is Back. If you're at the Nashville Comedy Festival, which is in Nashville, great night tonight. Bill Burr at the Bridgestone Arena. Bert Kreischer at the Ryman. He's got two shows. And Shane Gillis and Friends at Zany's. That is fantastic. Moon Tower tonight, tons of shows, including one called The Dork Forest, Jackie Cation, Guy Branham, Chris Kubas, and Atsuko Akatsuka. That's at five. Also at five, Pen Pals with Roy Scovel and Daniel Van Kirk. More headliney, Mark Marin. He plays a snake, but not a stereotypical snake. You can ask him about it tonight at the Paramount Theater, seven o'clock. Neil Brennan's at the stateside at seven. Big J Okerson, Dan Soder, and Jessica Kirsten are at Antone's at seven. 
Here's an interesting lineup at 8 o'clock. Dumb People Town, the Sklar Brothers, Daniel Van Kirk, Chris Redd, and Neil Brennan. I guess that's a podcast taping. Jessica Kirsten and Rachel Feinstein at the Creek in the Cave at 8. Chris Redd and Rosebud Baker at the Stateside at 9. And seriously, there are about 15 other shows that I didn't read. So if you're into comedy, get on a plane, man. Austin and or Nashville tonight. Or if you got a lot of miles at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, Ting Lim is performing. Ting's show is on Saturday because it's going to take you some time to get to Melbourne. See, I finally learned. I hooked you up. I'm giving you a chance. Get on a plane right now. Singaporean-born Ting Lim. Ting's comedy's taking her from Singapore to the Outback performing for drought-stricken communities, to opening for stars like Dimitri Martin. Pretty cool. Short old review, two of the shows down there. Cameron James' Electric Dreams, three and a half stars. Cringe-inducing teenage memories have been fueling comedians for years. Now Cameron James has packed his up in a cheerfully entertaining hour about his youthful rock star ambitions and picked up a Most Outstanding Show nomination for the efforts. All right. We start with the adult comedian giving a Wonder Years-style voiceover to footage of his 16-year-old self. He and his outfit, Electric Dreams, are just about to do the biggest gigs of their lives, the high school battle of the bands, with a set list that includes a ballad called A Love That Makes the Roses Cry. James has a guitar case full of awful band names like New Prophecy and You Prophecy, Tears and Roulette, plus cheesy song titles and insincere lyrics. He sang about sex and drugs and punkish rebellion with zero experience of any of those things. And now, after rediscovering a cache of teenage notebooks containing these masterpieces, he's ready to rock out again. I actually heard there's a podcast I like a lot called Weekly Planet. It's uh, two Aussies, and they talk pop culture every week. They just mentioned this on their newest episode that I just listened to on the run that I told you about at the beginning of the podcast. All this, see, it's all coming together. Another show at Melbourne, Damien Powers' Love Thy Neighbor. Chortle gave it three out of five. His first sentence is rough. This Damien Powers gig has a disconcerting energy, and it's largely the comedian's fault. Oh no, he repeatedly dips in the audience to comment on how they're reacting, often too defensively, which acts as a considerable break on the momentum he wants to build up. As an experienced comic, he even knows he's doing it, explaining that he's less used to attentive Melbourne audiences than uninterested crowds in rowdy pubs, but it's his seventh time at the festival, so he ought to have the hang of it by now. When he finally finds his rhythm, he has a good take on describing Gen Z as hypersexual environmentalists who take up activism to boost their social media profiles amid this epidemic of narcissism. He's withering on wellness fads, sexologists, and his ex's flagrant liar of a new husband. There's a well of frustration and bitterness here, which he draws upon skillfully, and he's a commanding performer. But after a strong middle, uh uh-oh, comes a weird muddled end, oh no, as he launches into a surreal fantasy about his dad and a band of comedy magicians who humiliated him. It's supposed to explain the sparkly microphone he uses all show, but only serves to detract from the caustic real-world humor that's at the heart of the hour. If you're in Melbourne, and you're not, but if you were, Melbourne Town Hall, Damien Power, Love Thy Neighbor, tonight and tomorrow, 8 o'clock. And that's your comedy news for today, right? Tomorrow is Gilbert Gottfried Stories Part 2, Sunday... It's a totally normal episode. You can follow this podcast for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, wherever you get your shows. If you like what I do, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash daily comedy news. Throw five bucks in the tip jar or take that same five bucks and become a premium subscriber on Apple Podcasts. Just open up the app. They'll put the option in front of you. You click it. It's kind of a frictionless way to throw five bucks my way. Actually, for something, Apple takes a cut. You know what I'm saying? See you tomorrow.